All right, panel of titans here. <laughs> Thanks, Cynthia, for giving us some good context for where the industry is now, too, so we can kind of get into some of the history of how we got here. Um, but first, uh, something we've all been waiting for, will the real Satoshi please stand up? <laughs> just, uh, just, just kidding, just kidding. Maybe you should have tried Simon Says there. Well, no, thank you, but no. <laughs> not Satoshi, but... Uh, but seriously, uh, all of you, you know, we would not be here today uh, without each of you, um, and, and want to kind of dive into uh, some of kind of your uh, innovations here. So start off with the godfather of it all, David. Uh, can you take us back to 81, 82, talk to us how you're thinking about the development of cryptography back then? Uh, well, sure. Uh, you know, I was a grad student at uh, Berkeley, and uh, this was a very different kind of time, but uh, I identified a fundamental problem which you could say blockchain is sort of the latest answer to, and that is how can people who don't trust each other trust a single computation to follow a, a public uh, algorithm and to communicate the results uh, securely to various users. And that problem was the basis for my dissertation and the way I tackled it was essentially with a kind of blockchain. And you, uh, people have analyzed this only recently because that work was kind of hidden for a long time in, in, in the library at uh, Berkeley. But it, it seems that it included both the permissioned and unpermissioned. It did not include proof of work, which is something, so it was, uh, filed and approved or whatever. I got my PhD in 82, and I guess it was a, a full decade later that uh, Cynthia Dwork and Monina Orr, who incidentally was one of my co-authors on an a, uh, offline electronic money paper, um, published the, the proof of work idea. I, mean, I remember clearly them presenting it at a conference that in fact, a series of conferences that I uh, created, the crypto conferences, and their whole big idea for its use was as a way to prevent a spam. Mm -hmm. uh, Messaging was kind of the a, 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 kind of a, a core part of how you're thinking about this until then, right? Yeah. So what, that's right. Uh, one of the, I mean, to me, privacy was a, a key aspect of the way information technology would unfold. And actually, so I developed three f basic ingredients to, let's say, meet the informational needs of, of consumers, of society, while protecting privacy. And so one of them was electronic money, the blind signatures, which I uh, published also in 82. And the second one was the so-called mixing for messaging. And that appeared in 79, but also, uh, as a technical report in 82, uh, appeared in, in uh, Journal of Computer Science, I believe, or was 83, perhaps. Um, and then there was a third component, which I called credential mechanisms, which is a kind of uh, identity, pseudonymous identity authentication scheme that allows the database information about an individual to be sort of turned inside out, returns control over that information to the person so you, you could prove the, uh, the correctness of any answer to any query about the database of information about yourself without revealing any more information. So I view that as a comprehensive kind of solution to personal privacy in the information age and I've spent a fair amount of effort trying to uh, publicize that and uh, right. uh, uh, explain it. Yeah. And this was the basis for the like Scientific American article and other, other work that I did at, at that time. So a lot of these basic ideas have their origin from right, right there at the beginning of, uh, of the 80s. Great. And then let's fast forward 10 years. Uh, 
DigiCash is coming about, the commercialization of the internet is you know, kind of possible at this point. Uh, also at the same time, something uh, interesting is, is happening uh, kind of around uh, Silicon Valley. Um, the cypherpunk movement is starting to ferment and, and uh, coalesce. Nick, can you take us back to that time? Uh, you were one of the early people with those in-person meetings. Mm. Uh, you and Tim, can you, can you take us back to the mindset that you had there and what you're thinking about? Sure. So there was, you could divide it into roughly two camps. One of them um, inspired by David and uh, very interested in privacy um, and so using encryption, public key cryptography, using David's technology involving mixes, which eventually became Tor, for example, and um, digital cash, um, blinded digital cash. To, um, but not really interested in, in new currencies or reforming mm -hmm. the money or that kind of thing. The second camp would, was the Tim May-inspired crypto-anarchist camp and a very libertarian uh, influence, like Ayn Rand's Galt's Gulch concept of a, of a self-sufficient economy that's independent of government. Mm -hmm. um, and so these were two of the main camps or inspirations, it, very intersecting and and, uh, but not necessarily parallel. Yeah. <clears throat> and then, uh, so these are in-person meetings, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, eventually we have uh, mailing lists and, and people can kind of coalesce online also. Right. Adam, when was your uh, kind of introduction to this community and, and what camp kind of most interested mm -hmm. you when you came in? Well, I think myself and Hal Finney and Wade I got into it through a group called the Extropians, which is like a libertarian futurist um, group. And, and Tim May kind of uh, got us interested in, in the cypherpunks. Yeah. Adam? And, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so I guess I was interested in... Um, I, I knew about uh, in public key encryption, and so when the cypherpunks list was created, that became a place where people who were interested in the sort of social implications of cryptography for asserting your rights to privacy online. I mean, you can think, think of the online world, which was a new thing at that time, and policy makers were grappling with what to think about all this new freedom that people had. But in a lot of ways, you had less rights online because ISPs could record everything. So, um, and I, w I was more of the kind of cypherpunk mindset that what we really needed, you know, there were people working on um, anonymous remailers so that you could directly assert your rights to privacy. So, mm -hmm. you know, there they would be regulations saying you have some rights to privacy, but they wouldn't be worth much. So it was better to enforce it directly. So I think that was a very kind of direct approach that if you want something, just build systems. And if people use them, then that becomes the new default. So just, just do things. People can figure out permissions or regulators can catch up decades later. So that kind of outs outlook and more interested in um, sort of hard final electronic cash. Um, and I think, you know, the intersection between um, the digital gold concept and electronic cash concept came about in the reverse order for me because I wasn't on the uh, extropian and the other list that Nick mentioned yesterday. I was on the cypherpunks list. So I started from the perspective of uh, needing private electronic cash to drive these privacy networks. So in order to, for them to be self-funding, to pay for the hosting, they were, they were run by volunteers largely, right? So it was, it was clear that you would need electronic cash to be meaningfully private online because you'd need to pay for things, pay for bandwidth, pay for electronic content, that kind of thing. So electronic cash was the kind of holy grail of this environment, and people would have been content for the electronic cash to be denominated in a fiat currency, but of course there's a barrier to entry there, which is need permission from a bank. <laughs> and I guess DigiCash kind of went through that because while they had a demo server, they were also trying to work with banks to get an entry to the system. So after DigiCash kind of uh, wound down as a commercial enterprise, the people who had tried the demo server and had the coins were stuck with the coins because the double spend database went away. And their thinking was, you know, that was a great idea, but we need a distributed way to achieve that so that it would continue to operate for decades into the future as different individuals and companies came and left. So um, I think proof of work became a, a mechanism to do that because you could, as Wei Dai put it with his B-Money proposal, 
you could have an electronic cash system without an interface to the banking network by mining the coins from scratch. Um, and I mean, going back to the proof of work uh, thing, it's, it's interesting actually, you know, there's a lot of sort of reinvention of similar ideas thread through decades of things here, but um, the proof of work, at the, at the time I proposed Hashcash, I hadn't read the Dwork paper, but somebody pointed out to me a, a few months after I published that, and um, coincidentally they had the same use case, where, except in my case I was operating a remailer, and people would spam through it to, to I think, actually because they were anti-privacy, and they wanted to annoy system administrators about the spam mm -hmm. coming through remailers, particularly onto Usenet, which is an ex expensive because it's broadcast. So, I thought about this kind of resourced waste, and normally the way that people combat spam is to try and identify and block the sender. But because it's a remailer, you definitionally don't know that. So it caused a sort of rethink to think, what well, was really the problem is that it's free. So how can we impose a cost, given that at that time there was no PayPal, and anyway, those things are, you know, credit cards and PayPal are all very identified, and this is an anonymous system. So that's where the kind of hash cash postage stamp came from. And it turns out, I mean, and that publishing that started a conversation about um, digital scarcity and use in systems that try to build a reusable electronic cash from it. And there were at least three of those, well, one being Nick Sabo's uh, Bitgold, another being Wei Dai's B-Money, both in 98, if I recall, and Hal Finney did another one in 2004 called Reusable Proof of Work. Um, Want to want to come back come back to those uh, step back real quick back to Digicash because we, we you know foundational uh, uh, kind of innovation at the time also uh, David can you take us back to kind of the founding of that and the uh, kind of purpose for the product of eCash as, as a part of it Sure uh, most people don't really know this and it's I had a Freedom of Information Act uh, process with the Dutch government to get information on this and recently. They decided they weren't going to give me any information, but the fact is that based on my publication of blind signatures from the 82, I was approached by the Dutch Ministry of uh, Infrastructure and Transportation to make uh, a highway speed road toll payment system like we have today uh, that would be smart card based and would protect the privacy of the uh, motorists. And they really needed this and wanted it because it was the only way to manage the, uh, the overused uh, highway system in the Netherlands. And we uh, told them we could do it. I told them that if they wanted to, us to build a, an actual proof of it that it could work with a, the same type of microcontroller that's using smart cards with the 6805, and you know, it's all, payments are, are completed in one meter of road travel, so that's only a few milliseconds. Uh, we would do it, and they would have to then like pay us to make a prototype system. So I got a bunch of uh, college students to like turn their one of their houses into kind of a lab, and we worked 24-7 for about the better part of 10 days and actually made a physical device and demonstrated it to these uh, consultants that the ministry had hired who were you know, dead set on proving that we couldn't possibly do it because they wanted the contract to do it without privacy. Anyways, and we succeeded, and so they gave us this uh, contract to build a, a demonstration system, and that was the beginning of the DigiCash company. And then I was invited to give a keynote at the first World Wide Web Conference in Geneva, and I used that opportunity to make the first eCash payment over the internet. And this was something that was widely reported globally at the time and created a tremendous amount of interest. And so we uh, built a system that uh, Adam mentioned. I, I wouldn't characterize it as a demo. It was, it was called Cyberbox and it was a currency 
that had a, a fixed cap on the total amount that we would issue, mm -hmm. and anyone who would build a shop online that would, would accept it, we would give 100 of these, they were called Cyberbox 2, and if you go to charm.com, you can see the little museum of all the, or many of the sh merchants we had uh, online, and so yeah. this was... recommend going there if you yeah, have all these old papers to, yeah. and things. It's yeah. pretty interesting, you can see all the press releases. Sure. So we did that, and then we also started working with various commercial banks around the world that wanted to issue eCash, and so it was actually issued by Deutsche Bank and Deutsche Marks at the time, which is the largest bank in Europe, and also in Australian dollars and US dollars and, and, and so forth, and so we helped banks issue it, it if they wish to, and in those days, you know, there wasn't enough computing power globally at, at any kind of reasonable cost to even entertain the idea of the kind of blockchain that we have today. So it was really the only w practical way to do it. And my final comment on, on that episode was that my personal goal was to put electronic money in people's hands that had this blind signature privacy that gave the individual control over their own information. And I believed that if you could get people to experience that control in a useful situation that the meme of mm -hmm. digital sovereignty would have a, a place to, uh, to catch from because, you know, the digital world was not something that was sort of top of mind uh, of the public in those days, and right. kind of in the way it is today. So that was why I, I did it, and I think with some, some success. Yeah, thanks. And, and uh, brought in Nick into the fold at 1.2. So Nick, yes. you, you write about smart contracts for the first time, mm -hmm. kind of around this uh, time frame also, mm -hmm. and then you actually join uh, Digicash. Can you talk a little bit about why, you, why that was uh, where you wanted to work and then kind of things that you saw while there that you thought could be innovated on later on? Yeah, so it's definitely one of the cool things for a cypherpunk to do is, is to, to work for David <laughs> and uh, do some eCash. And uh, so it, it did have those strengths of privacy that David talked about. It did have the weakness of the server or the company goes away, the... the the currency goes away, and also that the system administrator could print themselves um, some currency. So it was really strong in the privacy regard, but it wasn't really necessarily good as a private currency or for monetary reform. So kind of taking those lessons um, and thinking about it a while, I, I formed a list called LibTech that mm -hmm. had myself and Wei Dai and Tim May and Hal Finney on it among and Larry Selgin and George White, two economists um, who'd studied a lot of uh, privately issued money history, and came away from that with, uh, eventually, uh, that's where Bitgold and B-Money came out of, is that, that mailing list and the discussions that we had on there. So, um, and then smart contracts is a whole other separate thread, but. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then Adam kind of brings up, uh, you know, Hashcash and the mailing list, uh, it kind of is the next step. Uh, and then, you know, a year or two later, you come out with the idea of Bitgold. Right. So Hashcash already existed by the time we did LibTech in 1998, and so that mm -hmm. certainly was one of our building blocks and inspiration for, for Bitgold and B-Money. Yeah, yeah. So, Adam, maybe we want to come back to you here where we kind of interrupted before. Yeah, uh, I mean, so I think the, um, you know, as somebody who spent quite a bit of time uh, reading the academic papers, such as mm -hmm. David Chalmers and um, a colleague in friend of mine is uh, Stefan Brands, who was David Trump's uh, PhD student, he had another electronic cash system, and I'd implemented these electronic cash systems in libraries and was quite familiar with the cryptography and the trade-offs. So, you know, obviously we, we were, everybody on the Cypunks list was aware about the, the centralization issue, but didn't have a, a clear solution. So, you know, you could say that when Bitcoin was released that it took some getting used to for people with a cryptographic background because you're used to a uh, asymmetric security advantage for the defender. 
where you know you would, as a defender, you could do an operation very quickly, but the attacker would have to spend you know thousands of years in implausible calculation to break a single transaction. But with the sort of assumption that you should trust the central server, which is you know that's a difficult assumption in the real world, is what we found. So Bitcoin, on the other hand. There is uh, no asymmetry. <laughs> it's uh, you know one miner against another. So you have to get your head around the idea that hopefully over 50% of miners will be honest and try to play the protocol to optimize profit in a normal way, as opposed to by disrupting the system and uh, rolling back transactions and things like that. So you know that that's um, not ideal, but it exists and it works yeah. and it is decentralized and it turns out that's the key thing. So speaking for myself, I, I got interested in it from the perspective of, well, it, it really doesn't have a lot of cryptographic privacy or cryptographic fungibility. Well, let me try and use my knowledge of the electronic cash protocols to try and improve that. And so that's why, where I proposed what became known as confidential transactions, which mm -hmm. was an application of uh, zero knowledge range proofs to basically encrypt some parts of the transaction data and still have it publicly verifiable, but get a certain degree of privacy from, uh, from doing that. So yeah, I think that's the, the trade-off with Bitcoin. The decentralized mining, as Wei Dai put it, gives you an electronic cash system without a banking interface. And it's optimized for sort of survivability and decentralization. And the other, the other interesting thing is that the blind signature-based electronic cash protocols, uh, David Chorms, Stefan Brands, and there were others in the literature, um, provide cryptographic fungibility, which means that basically somebody can't censor your transaction simply because they can't identify it amongst any others. So their only choice would be to shut the system down or let it go, right? Whereas in Bitcoin, it's significantly transparent. Um, so you can see a trail of transactions going through the system. But nevertheless, you have de facto fungibility through decentralization in the sense that there are many competing miners. And if one miner chooses to not process your transaction, chances are in the next block, another miner will or another one will. And mm -hmm. it takes quite a lot of effort and coordination um, in order for the miners to collude collectively to block. And they'd have to take it really seriously and reach a degree of centralization and probably damage the value ultimately of the currency. So to date, that kind of property is largely held, at least for Bitcoin. And there's some other coins that haven't done so well in that regard. Yeah. And, and on that note, do you want to mention that uh, you all kind of recently rolled out uh, or announced some of your mining products. How do you think about those products uh, in kind of this context of centralization and yeah, competition? Yeah, well, I mean, so we actually got involved with that because of uh, concerns about the buildup in centralization, in particular, the sidechain concepts, which is a kind of connected chain that you might merge mine associated with Bitcoin. So miners could mine both the main Bitcoin chain and a related chain that doesn't have its own coin. It's just a way to move to extend Bitcoin. And that has less uh, incentive, like financial incentive to mine it correctly, because somebody can mine. With Bitcoin, all they can really do is try to undo a transaction and use that to cheat somebody. Whereas in a side chain, potentially miners, if hostile, could take the balance of coins in the chain. So you need a higher degree of decentralization to uh, feel comfortable about operating a side chain using mining only, which is preferable as it's very decentralized and permissionless. So mm -hmm. we got involved in mining because, you know, that was a couple of years ago when we first started. Centralization had got kind of out of control in, in mining. There were people doing the equivalent of selling mining machines, of selling mining machines as if they're voting machines and insisting that the buyer would vote for their favorite politician, which is not a good way to approach voting machines, nor a good way to approach decentralization in Bitcoin. So I would say that, you know, Bitcoin's value significantly stems from its permissionlessness and decentralization and sort of, you know, neutrality so that anybody can participate and that centralization is kept uh, decentralized enough to assure the properties of the system. Mm. John, David, uh, you might have had a comment there on... Uh... No, I mean, it's, you know, I, I, I think if you had to have kind of been there to experience this decades and decades of uh, developments that brought us to this point and I was trying to think of what aspects that hadn't really been mentioned but that really colored the whole thing and I think to me 
a key thing was even back in, before the web, it was clear to some of us, I think the people on stage here at least, that and p people had thought about this, and I think it was tangentially mentioned, that micropayments would be a way to organize all of online uh, resources and that there was a sort of countervailing competing approach which was the sort of advertising based model and in those days it seemed to make the most sense to people that I knew that it, you know, users would control the development of the system and, and, and everything by sort of uh, the, the micropayment based approach, but yeah, I think we, we misjudged the ability for people with very deep pockets to like push the, the data mining, advertising based approach uh, aggressively as the internet developed kind of explosively and predominate and that sadly has brought us to the world that we have today which you know I view as a, as a b big problem so if we had succeeded to maybe get the transaction costs down and decentralize a little more and and get the meme out it could be a very very different online world. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately there's some pretty fundamental limits and they're not computational limits, they're mental limits on how fine grain nickel and dime or yeah. fractions of nickel and dime people okay. want to keep track of. So. Yes, yeah, okay, the micropayment vision has the big problem that it's, it's more expensive to think about a micropayment than the value of the micropayment, right. but presumably this could be built in in a hidden way and yeah, I, mean, I don't I've, know. I've tried to think is, about that, but it's nobody's kind of come a moot debate at this <laughs> point. But <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying that back in the day, it, yeah, it, wasn't it could have wrong. been that these type of payments technologies could have created a very different online space than than we have today. Yeah, and, and, and Nick, certainly with, no. with your sorry, I don't oh, know. that was the hope back then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, it, should, it shouldn't be underestimated the you know as somebody who used DigiCash's electronic cash system and read with interest the developments that there was a lot of excitement about mm. this technology and what the company was doing. Yes. Something akin to Bitcoin. Obviously, Bitcoin has kind of exploded much bigger than that, but initially, initially it was a similar kind of vibe. Mm. So. For many of us, it's a return to the excitement of seeing electronic cash deployed finally. Yeah. Um, and I think the one thing that is new and helps Bitcoin adoption is the monetary for reform uh, aspect that Nick mentioned. So you know, the idea that it is an independent uh, floating value asset that became an investment instrument. So people get involved in Bitcoin through many different routes, like coincidental and buying a cup of coffee and then like read about it. And before they get too far into it, they get enamored by the ability to control your own money, to have sort of financial sovereignty and to do to uh, innovate permissionlessly on top of it in the same way that you can on the internet. So I think the, the fact that it's an investable asset actually multiplied the interest because a lot of people get interested originally because oh, the, the number's going up and they'll buy some, but then they read about it and they find it interesting independently of the value. So you know, depending on how you look at it, the fact that it is, has a floating value could be you know, the direction I came at it. It was because that was the only way we knew how to do it because we, we tried to you know, make something that you could mine that would have a stable price compared to the US dollar. That would have been acceptable, but it turned out harder to do that. And from Nick's perspective, I understand he actually wanted it to be independent, so it reformed the monetary supply. Mm -hmm. But in, in any case, that's, that's the way it arrived, and that turned out to be uh, sort of a multiplier in the adoption, I think. Yeah. And it, and it did arrive uh, after Nick and, and Halfini kind of had their own uh, innovations on top of uh, Hashcash and, and uh, uh, David's inventions. Um, so it arrives. Uh, 
uh, you know, two of you are cited in the white paper, and then Nick, you're uh, mentioned in Satoshi's writings on uh, Bitcoin talk uh, by name, and, and uh, uh, Bitgold is uh, mm -hmm. kind of cited as, as a progenitor of Bitcoin. Uh, so we, we have Bitcoin, and it's kind of proven itself over time that it's something that exists and has, uh, has value. Where do we go from, from here with that? How can Bitcoin be improved upon? Uh, maybe I'll, I want to start with, uh, with Adam on this and then uh, get Nick and David's thoughts too. So, I mean, I think there's, there's two things. So one is a kind of computer science thing, and Bitcoin is very uh, sort of bottom-up, low-level, very optimized, kind of like a Unix design philosophy. So it does one thing, does it well, has a simple model for coins. And, you know, ultimately, if you're talking about a highly valuable asset that members of the public have hundreds of billions of dollars invested in, you don't want to move fast and break things. That's the opposite of what you want. So I think Bitcoin's doing the right thing by focusing on security first. There is an enormous amount of uh, highly skilled uh, protocol developer and system level programming expertise poured into it because it's where all the action is. It's, you know, by volume, it's probably 90% of the crypto market, right? If you factor in the actual volume of usage and trading. So, I mean, I think in terms of improving it, I would look at it from the point of view of incrementally improving the, the computer science, the technology, the cryptography as new uh, techniques become available or as optimizations improve. But in terms of, um, you know, some people talk about uh, improving on Bitcoin as in making a whole new coin that is going to compete with and displace Bitcoin. And I find that argument to be um, implausible because Bitcoin has an enormous network effect and it would be disadvantageous to crypto as a whole if Bitcoin were to get displaced by, one of, by, by a competitor. But on a practical basis also, if there is some better technology, there's absolutely no reason that Bitcoin wouldn't and couldn't incorporate it. Um, including something quite novel and different, you know, let's say a completely different storage scheme, you would just snapshot the Bitcoin state of current ownership and import it into the new system. So, mm -hmm. you know, the fanciful ideas about displacing Bitcoin with something better, I think the only, the only way that would make sense is if you had a strong economic argument about, you know, uh, the disbursement of the funds or how they should be spread out or the ownership ratios or something like that. But I think you know, Bitcoin's network effect is such that it's here to stay, and if Bitcoin fails, it, it all fails. So I think we want to you know, put our energies into improving Bitcoin and making auxiliary systems that are platforms that add their own value and could even be paid for using Bitcoin. I mean, if Bitcoin is a general global electronic cash system, you can use it for micropayments using Lightning and use it in connected systems like sidechains and mm -hmm. other, other networks. Yeah. Nick, maybe I, also I, if you could share your thoughts. I, I on, largely concur with yeah. that. I would I would say though that although there, there's certainly network effect, um, Fiat's network effect is stronger. So there's certainly other things at play here, um, at Bitcoin success in that. And one of those I think is that certainly in 2011 I wrote about this. It's based on very unpopular opinions, such as security and and what they call trustlessness. I call trust minimization, mm -hmm. are really important core values. Whereas for almost all the other uh, coins, they're emphasizing transactions per second and this and that and the other, and they compromise security, they compromise trust minimization or governance. That's a huge compromise on trust minimization. Um, a big part of trust minimization is governance minimization. You minimize human decision making and the scope of what that can involve. Um, so Bitcoin believes a bunch of very unpopular things that nevertheless contribute to its success. It's successful because it's stuck to those unpopular core values. Mm. Um, and the other many, many coins have, have uh, been laid by the wayside because they didn't understand those values. They, they went with the popular values and that caused failure. Mm. Um, so I think that's a big, big part of Bitcoin success. Um, now Ethereum, has some of those values to some extent, but they also have a lot of other things like all sorts of utopian projects and governance. There's all sorts of creative things, but you know, 99% of them are bound to fail. And um, the, the Turing complete aspect of it is very valuable, but on the other hand, it comes at a huge cost. And as a result, um, there's a lot of problems with gas fees and centralization with a lot of 
Ethereum's just run on Infura now. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of vulnerability and um, fragility with Ethereum that you don't have with Bitcoin. Yeah. And, and um, we, did, we did get to Bitcoin through you know, a series of uh, attempts and failures. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there maybe potentially is a world where Bitcoin works and is what it is. And then uh, you know, things can still be attempted and, and maybe something uh, happens in, in, uh, in terms of a breakthrough uh, you know, it, with another protocol, another project. David, do you have anything to add to those comments? I think these are uh, wise and profound observations. Uh, however, you know, I mean, the U.S. government, I think, was planning to close the uh, United States Patent Office in, I think it was the 1860s, because they felt that anything that was worth having been invented had already been invented. So uh, I don't know. Uh, remains to be seen. There may, there's, I think quantum resistance might be, you never know when some nation state could could play that card. And yeah. that, th it would be, uh, I think, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, so I, I, I think it's, it's uh, and, um, you know, th there is a battle, I mean, Another th aspect I could s mention historically in, the, in, this, in our, the, the broader field of, of the use of cryptography publicly was that from the very beginning, the US government, for instance, was against it. Not only did they not want us to use uh, cryptography except uh, that that was offered by like US companies for US products, they didn't, certainly didn't want, to, they didn't want us to even think about cryptography, really do research in cryptography. So in 1982, the US government, the head, uh, the head of their national security agency, started writing letters to the major scientific organizations, threatening them with draconian legal repercussions for even having sessions, let alone whole conferences, on cryptography yeah. and unpopular ideas again. <laughs> yeah, it was so. You know, I, it, it, there is a battle on for global dominance in in currencies, and I think everyone's aware of that. And these digital currencies might be small players uh, in in that scheme of things, but some nation states seem to think that they could use this type of technology to great advantage. So yeah. I, I think we're at, 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 a, at, a, at, a, at a point where it's kind of hard to really say how this is all gonna play out, but it is probably a lot more important today than it was when we all started with this. And if you believe that digital sovereignty is critical, then it's only a part of the whole question of how is information technology going to affect life on this planet? Will it be do allow domination by a small group of centralized actors, whether they be people or, or machines or some uh, yeah. combination of them, or will it be, in fact, somewhat of a, a democratizing and... and uh, decentralized uh, kind of approach that, uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I, I hear Nick's perspective, and I, I, but uh, that's, I think is our, like, main chance. Yeah. And uh, Nick, I think you had some funny well, comments on Twitter about uh, like Facebook's Libra and some of these other competing. Uh, putting yeah, so, so the, the state-sponsored so-called cryptocurrencies and Libra and so forth, um, they basically gut the, the core, the unpopular idea that, tr that makes Bitcoin successful, trust minimization, mm -hmm. um, for the sake of, of supposedly more stability or, or this or that or the other. And so, you know, calling them cryptocurrency is kind of like calling a baby a doll. <laughs> right. it's, it's not really quite the same thing. It's missing something important. Yeah, there's no life there. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Adam, do you have a... Yeah, I mean, I think the... Um, that the internet technology has sort of changed people's opinions. So basically, it's a, like that uh, Bitcoin is a case where people have become accustomed to using something, 
and then they would not like to see it removed. And so it's, you know, it's decentralized enough that it's hard for democracies and civilized countries to prevent people from using it. So well, we'll see how it develops. And certainly, at the, I think at the moment, it's benefiting from being relatively small. I mean, we might think of 200 billion to 350 billion market cap as being a lot of money, but on the scale of uh, governments and national currencies, it's actually very small, you know, 1% mm -hmm. or less. I think you know, even compared to physical gold, I think Bitcoin's current total value is maybe 2 or 3% range. So we'll see how it develops. But I think, you know, as, as its usage grows and more people are holding, it becomes more unpopular to start to politically interfere with it. So there is some strength in numbers. So we'll see how the transition goes from being too small to care about to, do, to being right. very large and scary. I and mean, you see a preview of that in the, some government's reactions to Libra with the assumption that because Facebook has on the order of a billion users, that it could actually threaten the monetary policy of a smaller country that would then be using an electronic currency that is a basket of foreign currencies to them. I mean, that, that could be impactful to, a, to an economy. So um, I think, think of Bitcoin more like gold. It's like um, a secondary currency that you can use for the internet and hold as an investment diversification. And to hold to have the benefit of its advantages in sort of self-sovereignty and direct ownership. Yeah. All right. Uh, that was a great run through history and uh, kind of looking back at uh, how important each of you has been to getting us where we are. Uh, I want to do a quick lightning round on uh, just one, one uh, word, one sentence on the, the thing that you're most excited about, uh, about the development of Bitcoin or the ecosystem moving forward. Uh, Nick, what, what, what's kind of the well, most exciting of thing for you? That's, that's one of them. Yeah. <laughs> the second layer for Bitcoin that, that will enable the retail transactions that a lot of people think cryptocurrency is about. Um, and then, of course, making smart contracts more like contracts, more reverse engineering of law that I talked about in the presentation this morning or yeah. yesterday. All right. Lightning, smart contracts. Adam? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, at Blockstream, we've been working on a smart contracting language called Simplicity, which is designed for Bitcoin and using its low-level, efficient, but using formal security methods so that you can mathematically prove correctness of simple programs. So I think, like Bitcoin, starting bottom-up, keeping things with hard, provable computer security is the way to go. Cool. David, last word. Well, I think the real challenge is to make something that could be an attractive replacement product for consumers compared to WeChat or uh, Facebook or some of the other messaging integrated with payments and mini-app systems that are, that are uh, dominating consumer use of, of information technology. Mm. Sovereign data. Well, thank you all so much, and thank you for, uh, for joining us. That's our time here. So, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.